Are you ready? See you, Brad. It's time for another episode of Fireside Chat. It's Dan and Matt back with you after a thrilling end to the Boston Bruins game. Matt, what'd you think of that one? It was one of the most bizarre game-winning goals in overtime that I think I've ever seen in my entire life. Well, not even just the game-winning goal. I mean, you know, the goal to tie regulation was pretty exciting as well. Yeah, it was a good comeback. Yeah, and that's, I think, the Flames' 10th comeback now this season to to get a win. Yeah, that, they've seemed to have found the magic when they're trailing after two periods. They sure have. And, you know, that, that win really reminded me last night of something that we probably would have seen from the Flames' uh, now infamous 2003-2004 Stanley Cup team, the team that took the Flames to the Stanley Cup Finals. And uh, I guess a bit of a sad note on that front is the uh, loss this weekend that we found out about of former Flame Steve Montador. Steve Montador was found um, unconscious in his home at age 35 over the weekend and was pronounced dead shortly afterwards. Yeah, it's always difficult in situations like this. There are no details about any cause of his death. And, yeah, it's not good to speculate on anything like that. It's just sad all the way around. I believe the official word is said that it's not foul play, which is probably a good thing. Mm Mm-hmm. But, you know, Steve Montador struggled with concussions throughout his whole career. Um, he struggled with depression. So, you know, a lot of these NHL players have been going through concussions in their life, and many of them we don't even know about lately. I'm not saying that's what did him in, but I think a lot of these guys, even outside concussions, have a lot going on that maybe we don't know about. Yeah, and I'm hoping that Clint Malarchuk's uh, Hockey Talks program can help to bring about the more openness when people are having difficulties with depression and that like, it's just so frustrating that mental illnesses like depression get stigmatized for no real legitimate reason like it's no different than any other malady but for some reason It's treated as if it's just, oh, you're, you'll just stick with it and everything will get better. And it's not that like that. Yeah. I think that, um, you know, especially considering how young Steve Montador is, the hockey community doesn't tend to lose a lot of players young. Um, I know pro wrestling loses a lot of guys in their 30s and 40s, but I think the big shock here is just how young he is, and that's not something we see often. So hopefully if there is something that needs to be done, that makes the right people take notice. But, you know, looking online at players and people who have worked with Steve, everyone seems to say he's a great friend, a great teammate, and what a big loss he's going to be. And to me, he's always going to be known as one of the, in my eyes, um, one of the biggest pieces of that 2003-2004 run for the Flames. Oh, definitely. And I you know, I feel bad for all of his friends in the hockey community. Like I know neither of us have spoken with Montador in the past, but he seemed to be extremely well liked by basically everybody. Yeah. And just senseless. And I've I saw some of the tribute that the Flames paid to him um, before the before the Boston game. I've seen some of the tribute that other organizations have paid to him. You can definitely tell that for a guy that wasn't you know ever a top four defenseman or a guy that you know was ever really a star on any team, he definitely meant a lot to these organizations and the players that he played with. Yeah, and that's more of a credit to who he was as a person. Exactly. And he will be missed by quite a few people. Yeah. Yeah, too often I think those, you know, five, six defensemen are so interchangeable and go so unnoticed, especially a guy like Montador. But good for him for being, you know, such a, a well-remembered player. And another guy who, as we talked about last week, the Flames found as an undrafted free agent and brought into the league and actually, you know, made a credible NHLer out of. 
Yeah, it's just sad all the way around. Well, our our thoughts are with the Montador family and all of his friends at this time, and we hope that, uh, I guess for closure on everybody's sake, hopefully soon we'll find out um, what exactly happened. Yeah, and if uh, anybody is struggling with depression out there, please seek help. It, it can get better. It's just... It's not easy, but, you know, it, it's just so frustrating. Sometimes the things in life that, that are the hardest to do are the ones that are the most beneficial. Exactly. Well, going back to, um, I guess, a bit of a happier topic, not that, you know, we want to brush this under the rug, but don't want to spend too much time dwelling on it. Uh, the past week for the Flames. Overall, a good week. I think it was a weird week in terms of the games we won and lost. You and I both thought that we could beat the Kings, and that's the only one we lost. Yeah, the, the Kings, I think they came into the game a little better prepared. Uh, we kind of blitzed them the last few times that we played them, and they were taking the Flames seriously from start to finish. Yeah, it almost looked like they'd uh, done a bit more of their research, done a little bit more maybe video review before they got here, but they just seemed, yeah, they seemed like they had the Flames number a bit more than in the past, where it looked like perhaps a couple of the games we've played already, we maybe came out and blindsided them. Yeah, especially the performance of Johnny Gaudreau in mm -hmm. two of those games helped make the difference. So they quite effectively shut him and the rest of the Flames down. Yeah, they did. And, you know, it, they didn't get blown out. Like a 5-3 loss, I, I thought the Flames played okay. It definitely wasn't their worst game of the year, but it was a disappointing loss. Oh, yeah. A anytime you lose to a division rival that you're fighting for a playoff spot with, it's not the ideal situation, but at least they were able to bounce back and beat both Vancouver and Boston. Yeah, and by doing so, um, we're able to keep their playoff berth. They're now actually out of a wild card spot and sitting third in the Pacific Division, which is kind of nice. That gives us a little bit more wiggle room to fall down a little bit. Yeah, and uh, while we're recording, Nashville is beating San Jose, who is immediately behind us in the standings in by our one division. Point. So that helps, and... It doesn't really matter if, say, like Minnesota keeps winning and does excellent as long as we're better than San Jose because the top three in our division automatically make the playoffs, even if we are, say, the ninth or tenth ranked team. Yeah. So. Yeah, it's right. Good. Right now, the uh, the Pacific Division is, of course, Anaheim sitting number one. I don't think anyone's going to dethrone them. They have a ten point lead on both us and the Canucks. Vancouver sits second just because they have a game in hand on us, and the Flames sit third. Uh, the wild cards in the Western Conference right now are Winnipeg at 70 points. They should have more points than us, but just because of the way the divisions break down, they're the wild card. And San Jose is one point behind us at 66 points. Yeah, so as long as we can manage to stay ahead of both Los Angeles and San Jose, we're set. Those are the two teams I'm worried about. I don't think Minnesota is going to get enough points to beat L.A. and San Jose this late in the season. I think they might beat one of those teams, but I don't think they'll be able to beat them both. Yeah, it'll depend on how the rest of February goes. We'll get a better indication by then. And we also get to play Minnesota uh, tomorrow night, which will give us a little bit of an indication of you know what that, what that might look like if they can sneak into a wild card spot and we'd see them in the postseason. Yeah, and it was good that Vancouver halted their winning streak, and hopefully we can manage to overcome them for once. <laughs> yeah, well, I, I, it was nice to see the Flames beat the Canucks. I was really happy with that. And the Boston game that neither of us expected we were going to win, as we already talked about, that was a fantastic game. Great game to watch. I was watching it on a big screen. And yeah, it was just, it was such an emotional game as a Flames fan. We were down and then we slowly came back and I thought there's no way they're going to end up, you know, getting this to overtime and somehow the find a way Flames did it. Yeah, it, it was actually kind of a weird game. I, I thought the Flames were actually the better team throughout 
the entire game from start to finish. Because if you look at the Bruins' first and second goal, that was both of them were caused by turnovers by the Flames as they were exiting their own zone. And, you know, anytime you give a 2 on 0 to Bergeron and Marchand, the puck's usually going to be in the net. And the other one, it was just a seeing eye shot by Chara. So, you know, while it wasn't good that the Flames went down 3 nothing, I thought that they were actually the better team throughout. I think the Flames were definitely the better team in the second half of the game. I'm not sure I'd say they were the better team the whole game. I think the first period they made a lot of dumb mistakes. Oh, yeah, um, I agree with you there. And you you can't be the better team if you're the one making the, the big mistakes. True, but it seemed like the Flames were controlling most of the play, and then dumb mistake happened, pucks in the net. So... And, and, I mean, that's what the thing about Boston is you cannot afford to make mistakes against Boston. Definitely. Um, one thing you noticed that I didn't really notice watching on TV was uh, Johnny Goudreau seemed to get relegated in the fourth period to the fourth line. Um, his spot was given to Paul Byron, and he really got very little ice time in the third period. Yeah. Uh, what do you, what do you yeah. think happened there? Well, in the first period, he turned the puck over at the Flames' blue line, and that's uh, what ended up being the Zdeno Chara goal. And then, with four minutes remaining in the second period, he took his first penalty of the season, which was a double minor. And he just seemed to be making too many mistakes, and he eventually got benched, more or less, because, you know, being a first-liner playing on the fourth line that's as close of a benching as you can get so you know it was nice to see Paul Byron getting rewarded with some bonus ice time and he collected an assist while he was on the first line and yeah it it's actually important that the Flames coaching staff did that because you don't want to have the young players having a sense of entitlement that oh, I'm Johnny Gaudreau, I can be the all-star guy, and if I make mistakes, oh well, I'm still the first-line all-star guy. Though at the same time, I'm looking at his time on ice here. Um, it didn't seem to decrease much. He got nine shifts in the third period. Um, a lot of them short. He had a nine-second shift, a six-second shift, a 14-second shift, another nine-second shift, but he also had a minute nine-second shift, and he was on the ice for the Flames' goal. Yeah, he did get some shifts, but as you said, a lot of them were short yeah. ones on the fourth line. So He apparently had a one-second shift in the second period. Yeah, step on the ice, whistle goes, there you go. <laughs> Pretty much. So, yeah, I mean, he was getting short shifts all game, but he got his longest shift of the game in that period. But, yeah, a lot of short ones. So, um you're right. I mean, as the as the Flames talked about, it's about what's earned. And, you know, he wasn't playing his greatest game. And everyone has up games and down games. But, yeah, it's good to see the Flames say, okay, Johnny, we're going to put someone else out there who's perhaps having a better game. Yeah, and you need to have that accountability. And that's one of the things that previous iterations of the Calgary Flames has lacked. Like, there were games that, say, Jerome McGinley would be having a terrible game and yet he would still get 20 minutes just because he was Jerome Aginla. Yeah. And that's not how you build a championship team. You need everybody buying into what the coaches are selling. And, you know, you can't have too many individual players on the team. Yeah, no, you're, you're completely right. There's nights where we'd see Jerome just, you know, look awful. And not just Jerome. I mean, you know, other guys on the team were looking awful too, but they kept getting the minutes. And it's almost as though, yeah, management said, well, he's our first-line guy. And you you can't have that. Everyone plays a role, and you have to be willing to um, to look and say, hey, I'm not having a good night. I'd rather someone else get the minutes because it means that we're going to have a better game overall. Yeah, and with the other players getting the ice time, the Flames manage the comeback. Now, that's not to say that you bench him against Minnesota or set him in the press box, but sometimes players need to have a message sent to them, wake them up. 
And we did see him actually benched and sent to the press box earlier in the season. Yeah, and he actually played it well after that. And like, if you look at Josh Juris, he uh, sat in the press box a couple games ago, came back, and he's played excellent since. Yeah. To me, Ramo, or not Ramo, um, Goudreau has been so consistent so far this season, I see no reason to put him in the press box just because he maybe had one poor game against a very dominant team. Oh, yeah. I'm not advocating him getting press box time. It's just more of a wake-up call that you need to be paying a little bit better attention to the finer points of the game instead of being sloppy. And, you know, Michael Backlund, to add to it, he's kind of struggled this past week as well with some poor decision-making at times. And he caused the first Boston goal last night. And I think the coaching staff just needs to remind some players to be a little bit more focused on details instead of being too casual with the puck. Yeah, and that's something that, you know, I think with this group of players, it seems very easy to coach. That's probably something that they'll have no problem reminding these guys and working with them to get to make sure that's happening. Yeah, and it's not the end of the world. Like, big deal, you have a couple off games. As long as you're making strides to return to the your normal level of play, it's all good. Yeah, and, and that's, I mean, that's been the thing here is we'll see the Flames have, except for the streak of Christmas, we'll see them have an off game, and then we'll see them come back just fired up the next game. So I'm going to re- be really curious to see what team hits the ice against Minnesota tomorrow night. Yeah, and I'm actually surprised. I was considering like a 500 record this month uh, to be successful, and the Flames have already got five of the six wins that they would have needed for me to consider it a good month so yeah they've only lost twice this month so far once to la and once to the pen or or, and once the penguins it's good you know hopefully they can keep it up and make it seven or eight wins at the beginning of this month you and i were talking about how this was going to be the month that was going to make or break it for the flames well as long as they can keep up with all the teams that are pushing heavily they stand a good chance and if you look at the schedule, I think the next 10 games is the hardest stretch the Flames have this season. Yeah, and if they can manage the road trip effectively, they go on the road for the season-long seven-game road trip. Thanks to the Briar. Yeah. Yay, curling. Woo. Uh, <laughs> sorry if I offended any curling fans, but yeah. Yeah. Uh, Having three home games against Minnesota and a pair against Anaheim and then a whole Eastern Conference road trip, that'll be quite fun. Yeah, yeah, we'll, we'll see what happens. Um, it's definitely it's definitely going to be interesting to see what happens over the next couple of weeks with this team, with you know the games they're playing and what goes on there and roster moves and all that sort of thing. I think one of the most interesting things, though, is going to see what what happens between the net or between the cross, the pipes, I should say, in net. Um, we've seen that Ramo's been getting a little bit more time. We saw Ramo actually pulled in the first period against Boston, and uh, he and Hiller are rotating out a bit more, but they both have had successes and struggles lately. What do you make of that tandem? Yeah, with Hiller, he kind of started to fall into his old pattern of playing a little too much, and weak goals were starting to go in. And especially in the LA Kings game in the third, late in the second and the third period, uh, he kind of got a little lost in his play. Then Kari Ramo came in, he played well in the mop-up duty for the Kings game, played all right against Vancouver, and then he had struggles against Boston. And then Hiller came back in that, and he was successful. So it's just been a bit of an up-and-down week for the goaltenders for the Flames. Yeah, yeah, it has. And, you know, I think you said it right. Um, Ramo came into the Vancouver game and played okay. I don't think it was his best performance of the year, but it got the job done. Yeah, it was more that one goal that that Latvian player, I can't remember his name, scored in the first period where he kind of just whiffed on what 
looked to be an easy slap shot. But other than that, Ramo was played well enough to get the win. And uh, Pat Steinberg is reporting on Twitter that Hiller will be between the pipes tomorrow when the Flames take on the Wild. Um, to me, Hiller's still right now the number one guy here. Yeah, he's had some struggles. We all have struggles in that. Every team does. That's why you carry two goalies. But to me, I don't think that Hiller has lost that position yet. What about you? Oh, no. And the Flames seem to be almost more confident with Hiller in net, if that makes any sense. Well, that's true of most teams with a starting goalie. Yeah. It, they basically changed a lot after Hiller came in for Ramo. So, who knows? I... Ramo hasn't played any worse than he did last year over the course of the season. It's just Hiller's a, just a notch or two better overall, so I'd still go with Hiller for the rest of the season as the starter, but whether the Flames keep or trade Ramo and bring Ordeo up, in my mind, is still yet to be determined. And I mean, Ramos only played 40 games, or sorry, 20 games so far this season and played a total of 40 last year. So I think it's easier to look better or the same with half a body of work. You know, you're going to strip out a lot of the really good games and the really bad games you had in half that. So I, I think it's easier for him to, and I'm not saying he's not, but I think it's easier to say, yeah, he looks about the same, his stats are about the same, but he's only played half the games. Yeah, well, we still have 25 games left in the regular season, True. and he'd probably get 8 or 10 of those. So he'd be a little bit closer to the same amount of games as last year. His GAA is up la from last year, again, in 20 games, which you'd kind of expect. Um, his save percentage is down, and he has 9 wins and 5 losses so far. Yeah, it's one of those things that things tend to like that tend to balance out, and like he's had some real stinker games like Boston last night, but by and large, most of his games have been more or less the same as he was last year. The thing that I'm really happy to see in that this year is that Hiller has come back into the form that he looked like before last year. Um, you know, to me, Hiller was one of the premier goalies in the league for a couple of years. He lost his way at the end of his time in Anaheim, and we weren't sure which um, which Hiller, which Jonas Hiller, we were going to get here. If we were going to get what he was last year in Anaheim, or if we were going to get him back to his former self. And I'm so happy to see that he's gone back to what he could be. Yeah, like I remember at the beginning of the year commenting that like Hiller this isn't the same Jonas Hiller as previous years just uh to lower expectations you know because usually if a goalie is struggling and then comes from a contending team to one of the worst usually that means that their numbers are going to be terrible and they're going to struggle and instead Hiller's really revived his career entirely and has been quite excellent. Yeah, and that was the big kind of question mark for me coming into this year. And, you know, at first I didn't want to say, yeah, he's back. But I think more than halfway into the season, we can say that, yeah, Hiller's back to his usual form. Mm -hmm. and, and, he, and he's not the only player that we've heard didn't perform well under the regime that was in Anaheim. Yeah. And we've heard Solani and what he said. Well, that's it. So I think this is a common thread that was in that dressing room. Yeah. And it happens. You get coaches that favor certain players over others and politics. You know how it is. Yeah. So, Matt, with the Flames now having 10 comeback wins this season, the last one being last night against Boston... Are you like me in finding that this season, the Flames, because of that, it's making it so much more interesting to watch for Flames fans? You almost have to, you can't leave midway through the game anymore because you never know what's going to happen. You've got to watch the complete 60 minutes this year. Well, the Calgary Flames are playing like an NBA game. You only have to show up for the last five minutes. <laughs> 
Yeah, they're they're still not performing well in the first period. We could almost spot everyone, you know, one goal in 20 minutes and come out and play the second and third. Yeah, it's actually kind of curious that Sean Monaghan still has not scored in the first period this season. Maybe it's a superstition thing. Maybe they're like, Monty, don't go out there and score. Yeah. Wait till the second. Yeah, we need those overtime game-winning goals. That's right. Pad your stats. So, yeah, to me, at least, like, you know, it's one thing to win. It's And it's, you know, it is fun when your team is always winning in regulation and when they're getting up early in the game. But to me, it's been so much more fun this year to watch these games where you have to watch the entire game. You have to watch 60 minutes or at least, you know, like you said, the last five minutes, but you never know what's going to happen between there. So I found that I've been watching more 60 minute games this year than I have in the past. Or I might've just turned tune in the third or the, you know, the, even the last five, 10 minutes to see what was going on. Yeah. And they're playing a more exciting brand of hockey. Like even if they're trailing after one or two periods, you never feel like they're out of it. And especially lately, pretty much uh, since the middle of January, Calgary is starting to play better in each period. And, like, you're getting more 60-minute efforts like we've seen against the Sharks and uh, Vancouver most recently. So that's good. I I think the Flames kind of got lucky earlier in the season and perhaps caught teams flat-footed especially in November but now I think they're actually improving their overall level of play and are more of a legitimate playoff caliber team where that might not have been the case before yeah I think that's a good way to put it um you know to me it's almost saying yeah we got lucky in the beginning of the season it gave us time to work on our game time we may not have had otherwise and now that we've worked on that game and we're more than halfway through the season, we're seeing the Flames, as you said, play better games overall. More complete efforts, better games. It, we're not, I wouldn't say at this point, the Flames are still where they are because they're lucky. The Flames got there early because they were lucky, but they've had to display skill to keep up what they got early. Yeah, well, like if you look at the Sharks games as an example, like there was not a single point in either of those games where the game was in doubt for Calgary and they got up early and they just steamrolled them the entire 60 minute effort that really was never a case in the first three months of the season yeah yeah and and I mean there's been more games lately where you've looked at it and said okay the flames have this game in control like especially in the late second and early third, I looked at it and said, the Flames are finally controlling this game. It's not just these fluke, oh, wow, they went up and it went in the net. And, you know, we're seeing early on where the puck was just kind of bouncing right for them, but they never seemed like they actually controlled a period of hockey. Yeah, it was, they were playing more like at the first period and one minute of the Boston game from Boston's perspective. Yeah. Where, like, they weren't really doing anything right, and they just fluke out and, oh, there's a goal. And, yeah. Okay, great, awesome. They were but... capitalizing on other teams' mistakes and making the most out of them. Mm-hmm. And now it's more, they're driving the play, being relentless in their attack, and just basically controlling the game and it's a good to see them learning how to actually control the pace of a game do you think looking at the team now as opposed to looking at the team say one month ago in mid-january do you think that looking at their overall game you're more confident that this team has what it would take to get out of the first round of the playoffs it would depend on the matchup, but I think if the Flames faced either San Jose or Vancouver, I think they'd probably win in five or six, just because of their relentless work ethic. Well, and that's what we saw get them all the way in in uh, the 2003-2004 season was that work ethic and the depth. You know, the guys they were bringing in, like Montador, who was playing above his head, which we've seen this year as well. Um I agree with you. I think it depends on the matchup, but I'm more confident now, I guess, that no matter who we played, 
unless it was the Ducks, that we're probably not going home in four games. I think we, we've figured out who the Flames are, and the Flames have figured out how to control the game and play their style and not just rely on Locke anymore. Yeah, so I, and they have improved. And yeah. it's good to see, and hopefully they can keep this level of play at a sustainable level instead of having the bad habits creep back into their game and become more inconsistent. For sure. So we'll see what we'll see what we uh what we see from this team going forward and which I guess version of the Flames we're gonna see. If we're gonna see the Flames we've seen this month who've taken advantage of what they've been given and got a whole ton of wins or if we're going to see the team go back to kind of being the scattershot team that we saw at the beginning of the season. It's an exciting time to be a Flames fan. Talking about excitement, um, I'm surprised. Right now we're two weeks, pretty much two weeks to the day from the trade deadline. And usually at this point in the season, rumors are heating up all over the league. We're hearing rumors of all 30 teams and what they're trying to do. And this year it seems eerily quiet, doesn't it? Yeah, it's pretty much just a handful of rumors from mainly the Canadian teams and what they're doing and not really much of anything else. It's kind of bizarre. And even the rumors from the Canadian teams, they're not coming from the frequency that we've seen them in the past or with, I guess, the certainty among hockey media that we've seen in the past. Like, it seems to me in the past years, by this time, we've seen some of the big names like LeBron and Dreger and McKenzie pretty much calling deals that ended up happening sometime between then and the deadline. And we're not, you know, we're seeing some rumblings of stuff, but nothing where someone said, yeah, this is a done deal. Yeah. And like, even if you look at teams like Edmonton, like all you've heard of what they're planning on doing is trading Jeff Petrie and that's it. And there's no rumors on any of their other players. If they're going to, swap out like a guy like taylor hall there's none of that uh, where yeah. last year like we heard about Hemsky and several other rumors and like breeze galoff and a whole bunch of other guys and like this year it's nothing yeah and, and a lot of those guys that um that w- we have heard this year have been on the market have been pretty obvious you know it's like yeah okay toronto shopping everybody of course they're shopping everybody that sort of thing. But I think um, knowing what we know now, we're hearing a lot of, okay, so so and so is on the block, but we're not hearing what anyone's offering for that guy. Yeah, like uh, one of the rumors that was earlier in the season was Chris Stewart from Buffalo to Calgary or Boston. And okay, that's great, but. Uh, What's it going to cost? Yeah, like are they asking for a second round pick? Or a guy like Max Reinhardt. Yeah. You don't know. And there's no expanded details on what they're talking about. Uh, Like, is it just like a sixth round pick just to get them off their team? Who knows? Why don't we dive into the four rumors that you and I have found that seem like they could be credible. That seem like they're coming from sources that might have an inside track or someone that might know something. And then next week in our pre-trade deadline episode... Um, we'll dive more into the trade deadline, what the Flames are looking for, what they're probably going to offer, that sort of thing. Sounds like a plan. So the big name that you and I have been throwing around all year that probably is going to get dealt is Curtis Glencross. And uh, Elliot Friedman reported today that uh, Boston, Pittsburgh, and Winnipeg have all contacted the Flames kicking some tires on Glencross. Um, the tricky thing with him is he does have a, a no movement clause. I don't know if it's full or modified. I can't keep track of any of that stuff anymore, but we know Glenn Cross likes Calgary, likes the area. Can you see him being a fit in the Bruins, the Penguins or the Jets? Definitely on all three counts. Each of those teams need secondary scoring, especially Winnipeg, but I don't see any way that the Flames would help the Jets out considering they're fighting for a playoff spot with them currently. Yeah. But if the Jets want them, I think they'd have to pull a clever three-way deal in order to get them. Yeah. Or they'd have to overpay, which that, you know, if they want to do that, fine. (laughs) We'll take the added asset, whatever that might be. 
I don't know. I think that they're, I mean, not from probably management side, but I think maybe from Boston side, I wonder if there's some bad blood there with trading with the Flames because of what happened with the Jerome McGinley deal. Well, I think that the management, well, one would hope that management of other teams would let bygones be bygones. Like, that was two years ago. And we have a new GM in place now as well. Yeah, and it happened... Not much you can do. He the, yeah. the player ended up signing with you anyway, so I, I I would think that they would be a little more mature than holding old grudges, especially with the new GM. If we take uh, Winnipeg off the table, it's kind of interesting. That the two teams that are in on Glen Cross were the teams that were in on Jerome McGinley. Oh, well, it makes sense that they would have a frame of reference because of that. So Elliot Friedman reported today that um, as far as he knows, the Flames contract talks with Glenn Cross are going nowhere, which is probably more of a sign that they're going to move him. As I've said in the past, I don't think we can afford two years in a row to lose our most valuable deadline day asset for nothing, as they did with Camilleri last year. Yeah, and the only upside last year was that they managed to convince Colorado to give up a second round pick for Red O'Bara. Otherwise that deadline would have been a complete failure. But like I do the mental hurdle of just, you know, in my mind getting the second round pick for Camilleri. <laughs> Cause you know, that was a bit of a stupid trade on Colorado's part, but yeah. You, you know, know what, though? The way I looked at it is the Flames have been victim of so many stupid trades over the years. It's our turn to make a trade that everyone looks at as a stupid trade for the other team. Yeah, true enough. Um, with Glenn Cross, honestly, it, I've heard that some people complain about, like, if the Flames were only to get a second-round pick, that it wouldn't be worth trading them. But I look at past years in the NHL draft... And especially in the back half of the second round, and likely if it's a team like Boston or Pittsburgh or even Winnipeg, that pick's going to be in the 45 to 60 range. You look at the defensemen specifically in those draft years over the past five years, there are some really dynamite defensemen that have been selected in that area. And this year's draft is an excellent draft. And there are about 15 quality defensemen that are rated in the top 60 or so. So even if you only get a second round pick for Glenn Cross, you're, you can get a fairly dynamite defenseman with that selection. Yeah. Yeah, and, and I think that, you know, there's still value to Glenn Cross. It's been a great relationship between Curtis Glenn Cross and the Calgary Flames so far. And I think it's just one of those things that's run its course, and it's time for him just to move on. Yeah, it, it's one of those things. It's hard to separate the player from the asset. And Curtis Glenn Cross, the person, is well-liked by pretty much everybody in Calgary. I don't think there's too many people that hate on Curtis Glenn Cross, the person. It's just... From a hockey management standpoint, you need that asset to not amount to anything. Like, you need something in return. And remember that you can't get something without giving something up. So every time we give up a player that we really like and is very popular, it generally means that we're getting a, you know, a, a potential same asset back because you're not going to get a great defenseman for nothing. No, exactly, and like we can't it, trade Mark Kandari for a top defenseman. No, and you look around the league. Like even if you were to say trade with Pittsburgh, you're not going to get one of their top defenseman prospects for him, even if the guy was taken in the second round because they've already selected him and begun the process of developing him. So it's difficult to get that quality asset without using a draft pick. And, you know, with the way the Flames have been drafting lately, I would have no problem trading them for a draft pick 
with confidence that the Flames would convert that pick into something worth having. Yeah, like if you look at the four draft picks that the Flames had in the top 65 last year, Sam Bennett, he made the team out of training camp. If it wasn't for his injury, he would have already played games in the NHL. Uh, Mason McDonald has been excellent in the QMJHL. Hunter Smith is having a great season in the Ontario Hockey League. And Brandon Hickey is tearing up the NCAA. So if the Flames can manage to get another top 60-ish pick for Glenn Cross, you're going to get another player that is a top-tier guy to add to the already deep prospect pool that the Flames have. And, you know, even if that pick were to not be used and be to, you know, move for another asset, I'm fairly confident that, you know, we, if it was a second round pick, whether we use it or move it, we can't lose on that. No, we need the asset. And the thing is, is that with Calgary's farm team being stocked heavily with quality forwards that it's not like a situation where you're going to be bringing in a guy like Chris Colanos to replace Glenn Cross. You're going to be getting either a guy like Poirier, Berchi, Sam Bennett, Drew Shore, somebody good to come in and take his spot. Yeah. Well, uh, an interesting um, kind of rumor on that side is we talk a lot about moving him for a defenseman. But the fourth period dot com thinks that the Flames might be interested in Yari Toluski from uh, Carolina, who's a left winger, twenty six years old. He's generally averaged between twenty and thirty points a year. And when you and I were talking before the show and we heard this rumor, we thought, "Oh, why would they go after him?" But to me, that could make sense of moving Glenn Cross maybe to an organization that needs a bit more veteran presence as they start a rebuild, um, and bringing in a younger player, twenty six year old, who. It has about the same production as what we'd probably expect Glenn Cross to have going forward. Yeah, like, Toulouse is not an exceptionally good player. He's not bad. But if you look at where Glenn Cross has been in our lineup, he hasn't been a, you know, a top three guy. Some nights he's been top six, but I think that based on where we would need him in the lineup going forward, I think Toulouse could fit in very well as a, you know, six to nine forward. True. If it would depend on what the acquisition cost would be. Like if you can say trade Glenn Cross for a second and get say Tulusti or a similar ish guy from somebody else for say a fourth or a fifth round pick or a depth prospect like Reinhardt or Hanowski, then sure, why not? But to just go out and get Tulusti in a vacuum without getting the spot open by moving Glenn Cross, I think that's kind of pointless. Well, let's just say hypothetically it was a one-for-one one deal. What would you think? Uh, I would hate it entirely. Toulouse for Glenn Cross? Yeah. It, you think... Uh, what what kind of asset do you think would have to be thrown in there to make it more fair? Uh, well, Carolina wouldn't add him per se, but... Um, it would need to be somewhere in the neighborhood of a third round pick. I was thinking a fourth. Yeah. Yeah, I think if you could do Toulouse and a fourth for Glenn Cross, it would be an okay deal. It wouldn't be an exceptional deal for Calgary, but it might be the deal that might work best for everybody. True. And it's one of those things that Toulouse is kind of a undervalued player, and he might be like... Uh, what Joel Colborn or uh, Chris Russell have been. Well, if you look at it, that's kind of what Glenn Cross was when we got him. Yeah, because, like, Toulouse does have skill. I think he was a first-round pick back when he was drafted. And he just has never clicked with anybody. So it's one of those things, who knows, if the Flames could get him on the cheap, why not? Like, he does fit that age range. He's only 26. So that would make some sense. But it would be a, a secondary deal. It wouldn't be the primary one. No. And, you know, uh, maybe this is the wrong way of looking at it, but I almost look at it that with Glencross kind of being, in my eyes, the last of the old guard, 
I think we could all agree that the Flames probably didn't get the best deal they could have for Bo Meester. Probably didn't get the best deal they could have for Aginla. This is almost our chance to get something of value back for one of those pieces. Well, it's not like the pieces that we did get for Aginla and Bo Meester have been poor. They, Poirier and Klimchuk are good prospects. It's That's true. Yeah, it's not like we gave them away and got nothing. No, uh, but yeah, I mean, if you look at the sum of the parts, I guess, though, I mean, you know, we brought Kandari back, we brought Hanowski back, we brought Agostino back. I think there's probably, if we didn't need to move them in such a hurry, or if we would have done it a year earlier in Jerome's case, I think we could have got much better return. Yeah, it is what it is. Yeah. And hopefully the Flames can just get something for Glenn Cross. I don't see a need to, uh, like, hold out, per se, no. to get a better deal than what Glenn Cross is worth. And I think this year it's it's going to be kind of a you help us, we'll help you thing with the Flames. I think they'll probably say to Glenn Cross at some point, look, we're obviously not going to bring you back. You don't want to re-sign here. Contract talks are going nowhere. Help us find you the right home. Give us a list that's not too restrictive of teams you'll go to, and we'll make sure you move to one of them. Yeah, and I'm sure Glenn Cross wants to play in the playoffs, and, you know, either with Calgary or elsewhere. And as a guy who's a UFA, whether the Flames trade you to Pittsburgh or Boston or Winnipeg, you don't have to stay there forever. It's not like he's got four years there. I'd almost say trade me to whoever wants me at this point, and I can make a long-term decision in July. Yeah, exactly. And, like, I know he's looking for dollars in the offseason, and I don't blame him. Like, this will likely be his last value contract where he can demand $5 million. So, you know, you have to look at that in the offseason. But... The Flames, it, it would make absolutely zero sense to sign him to a contract anywhere near that. Yeah. And he knows that, you know, whether it's on March 2nd or in the middle of April, his time with Calgary is going to be coming to an end. And it sucks, but realities are realities. And, yeah, and I mean, more and more in the new NHL, I guess, the post-lockout NHL, players move on. Yeah, well, like we've seen again, he's already on his fourth team since he got traded. Yeah. I mean, even guys like, you know, Yager have played for how many teams since then? There's a lot of players that, yeah, they just move on. They follow the dollars, and and because everyone is fairly competitive now as far as salary cap, it's not just the money anymore. It's not like New York spending, you know, four or six million or whatever it was on their third line center Bobby Holik. Like nine. Everyone nine million? Yeah, it was nine. <laughs> wow. Everyone's got the same amount of money to play with, so you really get a better ch- choice of where do I want to go. Exactly. And like do you wanna go to a team like Nashville who normally wouldn't be able to spend any money, but because they're competitive, perhaps they can. Yeah, or you take a pay cut to be part of their team knowing you'll probably get deep in the playoffs. Exactly. Well, one last trade, I guess not really rumor, but uh, trade thought that was out there that I thought we'd explore. Uh, Pierre Lebrun today said that he wouldn't be surprised if the Flames talked to the Leafs about Phil Kessel. And his, I guess, rationale for that was pretty much that uh, Berkey brought Kessel to Toronto and Berkey might want to bring him here. He acknowledges Berkey's not in charge here. It it ultimately comes down to Treliving uh, to make that deal. But what would you think if the Flames were uh, to bring Phil Kessel in or even kick tires on him? Well, that's the thing. You have to kick tires. Like, it, yeah, you would be irresponsible not to. Because you don't know uh, what Toronto values, really. Uh, they might, because like the game that uh, the Flames played against Toronto in December, Marcus Granlund scored a fantastic goal in that game. So perhaps their perception of Granlund might be skewed because of that excellent play he made. So you don't know exactly what is in the mind of the other team until you talk to them. They might 
like Granlin, they might not. You don't know, and you don't know exactly what assets they would be looking for. Like, I would assume they would be asking for a first-round pick plus, but you don't know what that is. And if it's a cheap enough buy, you look at it. But I wouldn't go out of my way to overpay to get Kessel to come to Calgary. But if it was cheap, eh, why not? See, and that's the thing, is I think, personally, I think that Phil Kessel is going to be one of the biggest surprises in, at trade deadline day because I think someone's going to really overpay for him. The only time I can see the Flames maybe bringing him in is if they do what I've suggested the Flames do for a while and bring him in as a cap dump to Toronto. He's making $10 million this year uh, is, his, is his salary. His cap hits $8 million. So this is a guy who's got a lot of... Uh, cap hit and because of that maybe teams couldn't bring him in so maybe the Flames could get a value add there by saying Toronto we're going to take him off your hands you guys cover you know half the contract or heck we'll take the whole thing but it's going to cost you well the thing is that if uh, you're talking cap dump then likely what you would see is Kessel plus uh, David Clarkson for Ladislav Schmid plus other assets and in that case, I would be okay with it if the Flames are doing it and not giving a lot of value back. Yeah. But I wouldn't want to pay what I think the market rate would be for Phil Kessel because I think someone is going to d- overpay dearly for him and regret it. Yeah, I wouldn't overpay either. Like It, it would have to make sense on a bargain Yeah contract i think the only reason it wouldn't make sense if toronto needs to dump the eight million quickly we can help them there um otherwise i think he's going to go for at least a couple first and a prospect yeah and like i almost view it like how uh the flames tried to get uh a good prospect out of the kings uh for taking mike richards and it you know if the flames can get Kessel and have to take, say, Clarkson along with them, but you're only giving up a little thing instead of a big thing, then okay, maybe that's something to look at. But I certainly wouldn't pay full dollar on what a player like Kessel would cost. No, no. And, and I think, you know, even with Kessel having a big... You know, he's got $10 million salary this year, next year, in 2016, 2017, it jumps down to $9 million, And then the last year, it's $7 million. So he's going to have about an $8 million cap hit every year. Um, you know, I think he could be valuable here in the rebuild, kind of being that veteran, you know, first-line guy, which I think, you know, especially as we start bringing young guys like um, Bennett in, could be great to have to play with them, but yeah, I'm not willing to pay for that. I would rather take my chances on the UFA market and see what I might be able to bring in in the same role. It, exactly. Uh, all things being equal, like especially with the cap going down a bit this year, other opportunities are going to come up. So, it, you know, it, the Leafs are kind of not in the ideal position, especially no. with a contract that large how many teams can dump an $8 million contract into their current cap hit and be a-okay with that. And and the fact that he has such a long contract, Kessel, as well, same thing with Clarkson. They have an equally long contract. I think it's going to be harder to find a buyer because this is not a rental player. This team has to find room not, not only this year in their budget, which you can do, but would have to find, you know, $8 million again next year in the budget. Exactly. And the year after, and the year after that. And with the cap going down to, I, I've i heard, 68 or so, like teams are already going to be in a cap crunch. Like, over half the league is at, like, 65 plus. So, you know, how many teams are you going to be able to deal with? And yeah. Calgary's being the most cap of any team they can deal with adding 15 million dollars between uh or 13 million between Clarkson and Kessel and still have plenty of room to add beyond that. Yeah, that's the only 
that's the only way that I would take Kessel is if it was a salary dump and we're being compensated for taking him. If we're doing them a favor and it's a great deal for us, but I don't want to pay anywhere near what I think, knowing the Leafs and what they generally do on deadline day and what we've already seen, I don't want to pay anywhere near what I think market value is going to be. Oh, yeah. No, I wouldn't touch that with a 10-foot pole. <laughs> we're not in a situation where we're a Phil Kessel away from being a Stanley Cup team. Exactly. And we would do more harm long-term than good at this point, giving up what market value would be, which I think is going to be two first and a prospect. Yeah, or equivalent prospects. To a first, yeah. Yeah. It, yeah, it'd so, be like, say, giving our first rounder this year Poirier plus another solid young player. Like, give me yeah. a break. That No. No. No, exactly. <laughs> so, we'll see. Um, you know, that's kind of our, our first taste of deadline day rumors, and I imagine that over the next week, by the time we talk again next week, we'll hopefully have more because that's when uh, – that's a week from the deadline, and that even that week before the deadline, I find, is when everything starts to heat up. Yeah, that's when the a lot of trades start happening. Yeah. Like, we've only had two major ones uh, thus far, so that's when you start seeing the second and third line guys start moving with more regularity. Well, even some of the big deals that people want to get done early, like we generally see one deal kind of done the week before the deadline, at least. So I think that by Monday the 23rd, we're probably going to see a lot more rumors, and I think that's when everything's going to start heating up. Yep. It'll be fun. Well, Matt, I guess if there's nothing else to talk about, let's uh, look at next week and what's on, or I guess this week, and what's on tap. Yeah, uh, the Flames play the Minnesota Wild and the Anaheim Ducks at home. I just have to check the schedule. I don't think the Flames play any more this week. No, that's that. it. Uh, Wednesday, tomorrow night, they play the Wild. And then Friday, we've got the Ducks coming to the Dome. And then they get three days off before the long road trip. Yeah. So last week, uh, I, I thought four points. You changed just to be interesting. You changed things to six points on the week. Uh, we got four points last week, so I'm leading right now three to one. Yeah. For 2015. So, what do you think this week's gonna look like, Matt? Uh, it's gonna be a tough week. Um, both the teams that we're going up against are top tier teams. Even though Minnesota in the standings is just okay, they've been on one heck of a roll since the middle of January when we last faced them. So, I'm going to say an optimistic two points. Yeah, I'm sitting here. Before you said that, I thought, you know what? I think we can get out of this week with two points. Um, I don't know if we're going to get a win or if we're going to get two points the hard way and split two overtime losses. Um, I don't know. Yeah, I think I think two points in the week is going to be all we're going to be able to muster up this week. Well, you gotta go with something different than mine. So, all right, I, I'll tell you what. I will be the pessimist this week. I'm gonna say the Flames get a big goose egg this week. Yeah, I could see that. Unfortunately, uh, I, I don't want to say that's what's gonna happen, but I'll take the flyer this week, as you did last week, saying they're gonna win everything. I'm gonna take the flyer and say we win nothing. Boo! <laughs> I know. I don't. I can't in. I'm more confident in that than saying we're going to get four points. So watch them win both. And <laughs> Oh, I, I would love to be wrong. If, if I win this week at zero points, I'm going to be upset with the Flames. Yeah. <laughs> I want you to win this week because it means that the Flames won at least one of the games. You better win this week. Yeah. <laughs> so we got these, these two games, then, the, then a bit of a break, and then the Flames are on the road for seven games right through... Um, right through to the 9th of March they're on the road because of the Briars. So last couple home games in a while, I hope they can pull out the points they need here because I think it's going to be a tough road streak and we need to get some points before we take off. Yeah, and especially that road trip. Like All seven games are against Eastern Conference opponents and Calgary has been somewhat terrible this season against the Eastern Conference. So hopefully they can make up some of the ground on the east that we've given up 
Yeah, and I mean, you know, the fact it is against these two means that Western teams are going to be playing each other, which means somebody could pass us without us necessarily winning or losing to them. True. And that's, so that's actually good. Like, if the Flames do end up losing games on that road trip, it's not like it's going to affect our place as badly in the standings. No. It just means that our destiny might not be completely in our hands for two weeks. True. Fun times ahead. Yep. Well, Matt, you better win this week because I don't want us getting a goose egg. Uh, well, I'm hoping that I don't win this week because I want four points. You want four points. I, I. Okay, so let's put it this way. I hope that this week we're both losers. How about that? Sure. Let's get four points. Let's see how things go. I'm going to be at the game tomorrow night. I, you're going to be there tomorrow night? Yep. Should be a fun time. I'm actually taking a gentleman with me tomorrow to the game who comes from uh, the former Soviet bloc and has never been to a hockey game before, so that should be a lot of fun. Oh, well, that'll be different. He saw the Soviet Red Army play back in like the 80s or something, but he's never seen a North American hockey game. So we'll, I'll let you know next week if uh, what he thinks of that, if he, there's anything interesting that comes out of that. Yeah. Cool. Well, Matt, uh, it's been a great show, and... We will talk to you next week as we start to look ahead to the trade deadline. Yeah, it'll be fun. I'm looking forward to some interesting trade rumor talk. There better be some stuff to talk about out there because I don't want to be making up a bunch of rumors. Yeah, no. <laughs> Definitely not. If what we've got this week is all that's out there, it's going to be a boring show. So let's hope that trade talk heats up and we start getting even some moves to be made between now and then. That'd be a great thing to talk about as well. Till then. Talk to you later. Have a great week. Take care, everybody. Bye. Fireside Chat is edited by Mike Crosby and Brett Bauer. This show is licensed under Creative Commons license. For full license information, visit firesidechat.ca.